everybody. Welcome to Rude Awakening TV. Today uh, we are going to be doing some good cooking with some good cookware. So last week we took this really fun tour to a farm called Pine Lane Acres here in Bob Cajun and it was a sweet tour. We saw lots of things about sheep. Today we're going to take you on a little tour of our town of Bob Cajun and let me remind you it's not that we're taking you on this big journey to show you this little town. It's more so because we got some new camera equipment and we're trying to practice it. So practice using it. So we uh, went downtown with our little uh, new camera equipment and it is a, a gimbal, gimbal? A stabilizer and the funny thing is it's the most unstable and unsteady video you will see from us. We're learning. So uh, we are going to be cooking with some at all clad. I'd like to welcome uh, Snackington Palm in the chat. We've got another streamer, Darth Verbaca, is in all the way from Ohio. Excellent cook. Love watching Darth cook some really cool things. And I think, hello, hello. Hi, Darth. Nice to see you here. So uh, we're going to be doing this, this explanation of some really good cookware and recently I have upgraded all of my cookware to Allclad and uh, Allclad has sent me a few pieces too to show you. So uh, we are going to be using a, a au gratin pan today, a gratin pan. And the cool part about this piece of equipment, a hey, mobile Renault's here, this piece of equipment can go from oven to tabletop. So you know, if you have, they're, they're not, you can see my hand span, and they're about uh, maybe an inch and a half deep. So uh, what I'm saying about these is that this is a single serving. So if it, you know, you, if you've got children, maybe they would be hot, you'd want to rethink that, but this is a really nice, it could go freezer to oven to tabletop, it would work. So we're going to be doing some of that, and we're going to be showing you that, yes, some of the all clad is a bit premium priced, but also it's a lifetime guarantee and it is an investment into your kitchen. So we're going to be looking at some of that. First of all, let's make our drink o'clock. So today we are making a Moscow mule, not very difficult, but delicious. So we're starting off with some lime vodka. Now, if you notice, um, a Moscow mule is served in a copper cup and a copper mug, and I filled it with ice so that it would get nice and frosty. Sure, this is a summer drink, but we're going to make it today. So last night, we uh, went out to watch a hockey game, and uh, we went out to, uh, I won't say a name, and I ordered a margarita. And because it's winter, they told me that they couldn't make one because they didn't have the mix. I'm not a mixologist, but I know that if you've got one of these and you've got some tequila and some triple sec, you've got a margarita, but that's okay. So um, in the Moscow Mule, we're putting a little bit of vodka and we're going to put some fresh lime juice. Uh, Darth, you are from that Michigan area, Ohio, I know it's not Michigan, but uh, let's see, Darth, are you a hockey fan? Let's see if Darth is a hockey fan. Uh, like, we've got a little bit of rivalry in this house. We've got some uh, oh, Red Wings game last night. Now, Red Wings beat the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, about a week ago. Last night we uh, were at the Boston and Toronto game because because that's who, well we weren't right at the game, we went and watched the game at, at a pub because I really don't like to go to the Toronto arena. Anyway, Boston beat them and that's all that matters. So Darth, are you a Red Wings fan? Which would stand to reason. Cedar Point, that is. Is Cedar Point still a thing? Is it still a thing? Uh, Toledo is cool. Didn't hold the top. 
Oh, Blackhawks fan. Yeah, well, you know, they're kind of in a, a position right now that is not enviable, as we'll all look at those standings. Okay, so I'm mixing this between the two. This is just lime juice and vodka. Oh, I see. Hey, if somebody's got some tickets to a game, because we know what the price of tickets are. All right, so we've got a little bit of ginger beer. This is Canada Dry ginger beer. Just going to put that on top. I love a Moscow Mule. If you are a mixologist or just an avid Moscow Mule drinker, am I supposed to garnish this with anything? I'm going to put a little bit of lime in it, but I don't know if there's something we're supposed to put in there. I'm just going to put a piece of lime. Looks nice to me. Never had one. Oh, well, ginger beer and vodka. Excellent. So today we are going to be um, t using some all-clad cookware. Once I get this drink, I'm going to show you what I mean by what we, what we have today. Watch that mug is cold. It is cold in Kawartha Lakes today. Uh, I think it's about 15 below zero outside. That's Celsius. It's delicious. But it's supposed to warm up and we have had some snow. I like snow. I like cold. I like all those things that winter brings. So let's look at the all clad that I've got today. So we're going to be making this ham and scallop potatoes. And so I need about three pieces of cookware to do this. Yes, I have upgraded to the all clad cookware. I love it. But let's say you've got a cookware set that's suiting you. It could be some things you've had forever. It could be some things that are hand-me-downs. It could be something that you, you know, you could uh, buy at this time. But if you find yourself in a position that you'd like to purchase something for your, your kitchen to equip it into a something that is really well revered by home cooks, but also by professional chefs. And that is the all clad cookware. So today I'm going to show you uh, a saucepan that we need. And this is uh, a D. Okay. Oh, I see. This is a D5 uh, saucepan. Now in all clad, there's D3, there's D5, and there's copper core. So what, what I like to use is the D5 because I find that the D5 is, uh, it, it responds well, it, it's insulated well. D3 is a very affordable cookware, but I went to the D5 because I wanted middle of the road. The copper core uh, gets very pricey, and I also didn't think I was going to get much more from the copper core than I would from the D5. So you're going to say, well, like all these different numbers that she's using. So all clad is a cladding system that they put stain stainless steel outer, aluminum core, and stainless steel inner. So a D3 pan. Now let me show you a D3 pan. So this was sent to me, and I'm going to unbox it in front of you. This is a 0.5 quart saucepan. Uh, all clad calls it uh, a 0.5 quart butter warmer. The, although this cookware is uh, U.S. made, and it's made in Pennsylvania. So let's look at this little D5. Oh, look at this. So look how tiny this little D3 butter warmer, 0.5 quart. Uh, no, it's me asking. Oh, you're asking that. No, the butter warmer doesn't have a lid, but you, you know, you could lid it. You don't need to. So they call this a butter warmer, but it, I wouldn't reduce it to just being a butter warmer because uh, this is a single serving of a breakfast cereal. This is a poached egg. This is a little bit of a saute of a sauce. You know, there's a lot of things you can do with this size. This would not be something I'd say you must have in your equipment. But a saucepan, now this is the D5. What's the difference? D3 has, yay, Allison Chains is here. Allison, we're just talking about cookware. And, you know, this is a thing that you have to be prepared to invest in. And you only need 
one piece to start your kitchen off. You could do just about everything in one piece of cookware. Of course, you're going to want to skillet because that rounds you off. But let's look at the difference between a D3 and a D5. So the D3 has three layers, stainless steel, aluminum core, stainless steel inner. The D5 has two stainless steel outside layers, two aluminum, and then one, core, one inside stainless steel. So there's your five clad layers. This little one, great for a well-rounded kitchen. You don't really need it at the beginning. So what I'm going to say is, let's, let's say you, you say today, yeah, I, need, I really do need to do something about the way I cook. And, or maybe in the future, when I am standing in the middle of that cook store and I think, you know what, I can buy myself something. Look for the all clad. So here's the D3 saucepan. And here is a 10 inch. No, oh, that's right, I'm sorry. This is D5. This is a 10 inch skillet. It's also the D5. Little bit heavier. So if you're an older person that has a little bit of arthritis or you're smaller, it, all of these work in an induction. Yes, they do. And I have induction. Even the copper core does. Now, when you, if you price this out and you, get, you see the price difference between a D3 and a copper core, there's a little bit of a price range. The D3, uh, I don't have a D3. The D3 is affordable. D5 is affordable, copper core, you need to think about that. That's the difference I look at it. I find that the D5 has a really nice response. It holds the heat. I find that it, it, it maintains, it sustains your temperature, and it evenly cooks. I want to show you a few things that really sell me on this cookware. First of all, there's a flared edge. Now, to the average cook, you might say, what, what does that do? But when you go to pour something out, it's not going to dribble down and it's not going to spill in awkward ways. It's going to pour out smoothly because of that fla flared edge. Also, let's look at the handle and we, let's look, use the overhead for this. So this handle is something that is talked about if you, if you go on, like I do, sites that discuss cookware, uh, this is a handle that is patented to all clad. So you'll see that there's a divot in the handle. That's so that you can place your thumb and you can have a good grip. It, there's no heat in the handle, but the thumb and the placement of that makes a really secure hold. Underneath there's a bolster, if you can see that bolster. That is very unique to this, uh, to all clad because that way when you're touching it, you don't go closer to the pan, you don't accidentally slip with the pan. It is a firm hold, thumb and bolster underneath. I really like this cookware, as you can tell. So today we're going to be using this to start off our scalloped potatoes, and we're going to be using the skillet to fry some onions. So let's, let's go into that. So uh, let's see, I'm just gonna look because next week I'm showing you how to clean it. And it can take a lot of use. It just can't be cleaned with harsh chemicals. And that makes sense. You, you can't do that. Uh, I'm going to start making the sauce right now. So what I want to do is heat my pan. And I'm back to this cooktop. And it's not the best. I should use my induction, but I didn't. And I'm going to be melting. We've got a recipe for you if you want to put that up. I'm going to be melting a little bit of butter. So speakeasy, how did the Frandisco party go last night? I was on for a little tiny bit and I saw that it was rocking. It looked like a good time. I got to tell you, the Friday night stream using Jeopardy uh, was, was brilliant. I just cannot believe the information that Allison has in her head. <laughs> you are the reigning Jeopardy champ. I, I mean... I loved watching it. There's maybe 50% of those I may have been able to uh, answer, but I'm overwhelmed with. And you know, I always thought, thought Chris was really full of all of those tidbits of knowledge, but holy cow. 
it was it was a landslide win for you. So we're going to melt the butter in uh, the, the saucepan that I love. Like I'm saying to you about your upgrading though, one piece, one piece, use all the other ones you have, but one piece, it could be a saucepan and then you start from there and you'll use it and use it. I think Jeopardy is going to be uh, my, it's going to be uh, the new drag race. I know it, it, it <laughs> it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work for Liz to make all those questions. Too bad, there, is there a site you can just go to and like find all of these Jeopardy questions? The only thing is the questions relate directly to the Speakeasy channel. So, all right, butter is melting nicely. Uh, so how do you make, I'm basically making a white sauce. And so, you know, what are we doing? We're going to put a little bit of butter, a little bit of flour, some milk. You know, then we're just doing a basic white sauce. And then we're going to build this scallop potato and ham gratin in uh, these little gratin pans, which, you know, you could do it in a casserole dish too. It works just as well. I just want to use these today. I don't even think this would be something that I would necessarily say I have to have that in my kitchen. But once they were in here, I really found lots of use for them. So the butter is uh, melted. I'm going to add some flour. So just a couple tablespoons of flour. Just put the recipe up so they can follow. Two tablespoons of flour into this. For those of you who were on my stream last week, you'll, I used a new induction cooktop for the side here. And uh, it's already gone back because, first of all, it made a lot of noise. And if you uh, go on to Thistle and Oak, uh, they're streaming right now, don't go right now. But uh, if you go on, they'll tell you the same thing, the induction. Darth, I think you use, when you uh, stream, you use your stove right in front of you. And then I'm going to put about a cup and a half of milk in there. So here goes my white sauce starting to cook. If you want to see a very warm, welcoming streamer, uh, Darth Frabaka, he streams, uh, I'm not really sure of your schedule, but easy to find in the food and drink. Very warm, welcoming, funny, casual himself. And I love it. I feel welcome there always. He's my kind of people. Okay, so um, I've got butter, a little bit of flour, some milk, and we're going to have to let that thicken. This, I'm going to start peeling the potatoes. This is a good time for us to go to our video. So let me just prompt it a bit. So this is a little video we made of downtown Bob Cajun. Again, why did we make this? Sure, I want to show you where I live and I want to, you know, just show you the fun of a little town. But I also, we wanted to use this new equipment. We're learning. And what we have to do is use that equipment outside because our farm tours are mostly outside, so we have to get accustomed to that. So let's go watch that video. <clears throat> We're here at the end of Bolton Street, Main Street. It's, it's the lake that leads you into Pigeon Lake, goes towards Lock 32. Just down around the corner was my childhood home. If you look around there, there's some pretty nice homes here. There's lots of forest across. This is the beautiful Kawartha Lakes. Let's go 
go for a walk and show you the sights of this town. So when you think of Bob Cajun and you think of a tourist town, you think of boats running in the lock, people coming to visit, but what you don't think about is how dead it is in the winter. We're going to show you some of the shops, they're still operating. shop called British classic British country wear let's go in show you around say hello to the owners So there's a lawyer over there. Even in the winter, people need a lawyer. Let's cross the street. This is King Street. Uh, King Street's where the Bob Cajun Bakery is. There's a few shops down there. That's where the LCBO and the beer store is. You gotta know that in small town Ontario. Yeah. Sign out every morning, right at 10, I get the sign out. We're here. Uh, we don't really need to go in if you just want to wave from the door. Thank you. And, that, and, and Sunday at noon, it's on our channel, so uh, Becca could fill you. Oh, here, I'll give you the card. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is Globus Box Office. Globus is a theater here in the core of the lakes. They run all year round and they have some great shows. Check them out. Another fun little boutique to visit during the winter hours. The winter hours are adjusted, but the green tree frog carries our granola. They carry red milk maple syrup. They carry a lot of local uh, products, and they also are a resale shop. Another shop to make sure you come and visit if you visit our, our little town. This is Lock 32. Uh, you'll see that our swing bridge is out of commission right now. They're doing some repairs. So this is where you would come from Pigeon Lake, and then you would go through the locks, adjust the level to Sturgeon Lake, and that's why you have to go through locks. This is Big Lee's, one of the biggest retailers in Bob Cajun. If you come to Bob Cajun and you've heard about all the shoes. We are open. There's people here. There's people saying yeah, hello to you I every day. There's more people on the street. Well, as we're walking up, I mean, people don't open till 11. I saw you on the other side. <laughs> yes, we're open. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we'll see you home. again. Thank you. The afternoons are normally busier. Well, sure, and it's a it's a Tuesday, so yeah. you know. are ending our Bolton Street tour at Daylight Diner. Let's go in and say hello. Hi! We would like a baby cone of pistachio almond and a baby cone of banana boat. This time of year, some of the flavors have to be made. Maple? <laughs> Maple walnut or sugar shack? Sugar shack. Yeah, we can do that We'll one. take two of those? Okay, two of those. Two baby cones or cups? Uh, cones, please. Right. The regular cones? Yeah, just the regular cones. Thank you. Ready? Okay, we're back. Okay, it's fun. Put that off. <laughs> it, it, it's a fun little town. Like I said, it's a small town, Ontario. And <clears throat> what we're trying to show you is there are places open. It's a great day trip. It's a lot of fun in the summer. We will do another tour in the summer. So uh, let's go on to our cooking. It was nice. Now, if you see at the end, there was uh, a m memorial of the, um, a lady who I have to admire her. She sold us our house when we came here. That's not why I admire her. Uh, this lady sold real estate for 50 years in this town. She sold generations upon generations homes. And she was 88 years old and she had just shown some homes she went back to her office, still working, still selling real estate, still sharp as a tack, and she passed away doing what she loved. And I went into the real estate office to say hello to her and ask her to be on our video, and we found out that she had recently passed away. So that was a hard realization when we found that out because that was one hard working woman. All right, we are uh, in the process right now. I put some olive oil into our, our skillet, and I'm going to saute some onions. Now, if you really think about, uh, uh, welcome to Andrea. I noticed you, were, you came on while we were doing our little tour. I would like to see everybody who's in the chat, I would like to see you in our little town again soon. And yes, we had some guests uh, two summers ago. Every summer, the Speakeasy crew comes up here, and I look forward to that all year. But two summers ago, we had a rather loud experience with a couple of uh, guests, and they brought a lot of attention to us down in our conservative little town. But you know, it's not that conservative because we have a lot of visitors. And so I think when you live in a tourist town, 
you become, uh, what would you say, more tolerant of whatever people come here to do. You know, if you come here to boat and party and have a good time, I have a feeling that most of us uh, enjoy that. You bring us some life. There might be some people who don't enjoy that, but you shouldn't live in a tourist town that brings boats. But in the summertime too, that's what a lot of those retailers that you saw downtown really enjoy the benefits of all of our tourists as well. So I am just right now dicing up some onions. I'm going to saute, not dicing, I'm slicing them. I'm going to saute them and we're going to, that's going to help build up our gratin. So I'm not sure if I like this second step. I did make the white sauce and the white sauce is over here cooling. So it's just a, a white roux and uh, I put some salt and pepper. Now, if you're a cook and you're in the chat, I want you to ask, answer this question. What's the purpose of salt? And then I want you to compare it to what's the purpose of pepper? You know, pepper and salt are the most sought after and the most grabbed seasonings. What is the purpose of each one of those? And I know that everybody here is a cook. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Why do you grab the salt and why do you grab the pepper? Let's see if anybody has an answer for that. I'm going to, I'm just slicing up the uh, potatoes really thin. You don't want them thick. And this is a russet, and I peeled it while we were in that video. This is a russet potato, and I'm slicing them as thin as I could. I could use a mandolin, but I prefer to do everything I can by hand. Except mixing pie dough. So if, if anybody is sitting there thinking, I'm not going to answer that because it's too obvious of an answer, I'm not going to say what I think. The reason why you grab salt is it enhances your food. It doesn't change it, it enhances it. When you've put too much, then you changed it. And you know when someone says, oh, this tastes, this is salty, you haven't enhanced your food, you've changed it. So the trick is to put just enough salt, and that could be by taste. Oop, I was going to put that in there. But it's to enhance. Now, pepper is the other way. It changes it. And some of us like a lot of pepper and some of us don't. But remember, pepper will change it. Uh, I, I, I'm not a heavy salter, but I understand that, you know, you can always add it. It's impossible to take it away. But it does create, like right now, I can salt those onions. It does release moisture and it helps the onions caramelize a lot faster. And, you know, layer your, layer your seasonings, layer your flavors, layer your enhancers. This is a kosher salt that I use in here, coarse kosher salt that grinds, and we'll, pep we'll put some pepper to give it that nice home-cooked flavor. And I am in the process of thinly slicing these russet potatoes. Once I get all of the elements prepared, I can start building the gratins, and then we will put those in the oven. So our little town is uh, open. Now that was a Tuesday and it was an afternoon. What happens in uh, smaller towns is that main places will be open, like the grocery stores will be open and people fluctuate their hours. We're going to do another tour because we have received some emails from people saying, or some messages from people saying, you missed our store, can you come back? Because they saw that this is going to be a fun thing for the little town to have. So we're going to do another one, but we're going to do it on a Saturday. And you'll see, it's an entirely different scenario downtown. Yeah, that was morning. We'll, we'll go in the afternoon on a Saturday. Today we have beautiful sunshine. I'm sure that there'll be lots of activity in our town. 
So I'm going to stir these onions so that they can cook. Just, I'm just, I just want to soften them a bit, add some flavor to them, caramelize them a bit. After we're done with the gratins and we have them ready for the oven, we are making a cake today that dates, and, and we're coming back to our nostalgic, our, our, our vintage cooking. We are making a cake today that dates back to about 1920. And it's when uh, dairy and eggs were not only, uh, they weren't rationed, they were scarce. And so we are making a chocolate cake where you use a mayonnaise, and surprisingly enough, mayonnaise was always available. I'm going to turn the heat up a bit more to get some caramelizing going on. So Speakeasy Channel is our affiliate channel and they have a lot of streams, a lot of content coming out of that channel, at studio. And this weekend was a, a really busy weekend there. So uh, if you get a chance, if you're on here and you're not from the Speakeasy channel, if you could just give them a follow, give them a look-see, and you're going to find out, especially uh, Darth, you would enjoy this because it's, it's wacky humor. These are, these are fun people. And uh, Andrea is on the, in the chat as well. Her streams are very fun. I enjoy them because they are a sit back and enjoy some good conversation. Okay, I'm getting a nice softening going here. I could probably do it a bit more. Maybe I do see the importance of this step. So, we've got some ham, and I'm going to dice that up if you want to use the overhead. Ham. I know, I take my A's and I make them really nasally. I've been told that before. This is, uh, you know, sliced up ham. We're always looking for ways to use up leftover ham. Yes, I have made... Uh, a split pea soup. I have made uh, biscuits. I have made a casserole. I've over, and this is it. And I thought, well, what can I do? I might have too much here for those. Uh, I'm, I might have too much of everything. So I, if I don't, if they don't fit in here, I will put them in a small casserole and make one for tomorrow. Because this can go into, I don't like to freeze ham. This can go into the fridge and can be used for another meal. Now if you'll notice this uh, all clad skillet, it is, it's not, it's, it's non, not non-stick, uh, but you don't, it releases it. So if you cook with a little bit of olive oil and you cook with salt, salt will give you some, some liquid that will help your food release. Don't be afraid of salt like as I, as I put some salt on it. It's going to help, it's going to help you have a non-stick surface. And then a little bit of browning, but the thing about these pans is once I put, I'm done cooking and I put a little water in it, it will wipe right out. And if it gets really stuck, I put a little, oh, I'm doing this next week. You put a little water, you put it on your stove, you cook it a little bit, you steam it a little bit and it'll lift right off. So I've got a nice, mm, I can smell them now. I'm getting a real nice bit of color on it. Okay, we are going to uh, shut this down. The smell is divine. Nobody can say that they don't love the smell of fried onions. Every carnival goer will know that. So I've, get, I've got a little bit of cheese that I grated. This is a really uh, really dry cheddar cheese, an old cheddar cheese. And I am going to put the onions here, let them just cool a bit, and we're going to start to build. So I take a gratin pen, and I'm going to first put a little, well, I'm going to do them two at a time. I'm going to put a little white sauce, use the overhead and you'll be able to see this. I'm going to put a little white sauce uh, on the base of each one. Just spread it around. Nice. I'm going to reserve it because I want to do as many layers as I can. That's the idea. So I've got this white sauce on the bottom. Yeah, I've got all these ingredients. Oh, I can put the whole board forward there. 
Okay, and then I'm going to build uh, a, a few potatoes, overlap them so that you get a good even seal. So this is nothing more like a lasagna where you're going to get your ingredients ready and then you're going to assemble. And I peeled this one just as you were on the video because I didn't want it to go brown. And this is two russet potatoes. I kind of thought one each. Uh, I need a little spoon. Oh my. I'm going to put a little bit of onion, fried onions on top of the potatoes. Actually, I think the recipe I have put up is exactly enough for two servings. So, Allison, this would be good for you. I mean, if you can just buy a ham steak, too. Then I'm going to put some of that diced ham in there. Ham, I know every time I say it, Tom laughs. He wasn't laughing last night, though, when the Bruins scored that last goal. And then we're going to take some of that really old cheddar cheese. It's white cheddar. Yeah, the orange would have been better. But this is what I had still left over from Christmas. Still trying to get through the nice things we had at Christmas time. Now, that's enough there. What do you think I'm going to put next? I'm going to put a little bit more white sauce. I could thin this white sauce out, maybe with a little bit of either broth or a little bit more milk, but I'll just put that there. You don't have to spread it too much. It's going to make a mess. And now um, I'm going to put some more potatoes, another layer. So I think I'm going to get two potatoes uh, on two layers of potatoes on each one of these. These uh, little gratin pans, I think they retail, they come in two like this. I think they retail for about $75 a piece. And uh, not a piece, I'm sorry, two, $75 for the set of two. And they're, you know, it's, it, it's an extra. Again, if you are looking to buy one piece, you want to look for a saucepan. And then I'm going to put some onions again. This will be the last onion. So this was about uh, two small yellow onions in here. Put that on top. Okay. Oh, you know what? Remember I said I didn't think that this step was necessary to do the onions like this? I think it was very necessary. And now my pan, you can see it. It has a little bit of color from, from cooking. I am just going to put some oil, water, <laughs> I'm going to let that sit while we're still building. And I'm going to maybe put a little bit more ham. Ham. <laughs> and I'm, I don't think there's a set order. You just do it, whatever the ingredients you have. I'd like to use up as much of this ham as I can. But, you know, you don't want to overload it. I'm going to give it a little bit of a press. Okay. We came home from that video, and it turned miraculously sunny outside. It was like, what? Okay, this is nice. You know what? I've just noticed using this spatula, I'm getting a little bit more of, a, of an ability to spread it. So I'm going to spread that as much as I can. Now, so if you see that recipe that's up, that nicely made two servings, or it would have made, I mean, you could double it and you could have made a family size. Okay, that's nice. And how do you think I'm going to top this? I'm going to top this with, clearing up these little bits that are left. I am going to top this with cheddar cheese. Yeah, that'll be nice. And this was about, in, in the recipe, I think it called for about uh, a cup. Because when I'm cooking, I'm usually trying to gear it around one or two, I mean, two to three, four servings. That's about, that's about as much as I like to cook at a time. 
I believe at one time I used to cook a lot more in bulk, but now I have more time to cook. And so I cook in smaller amounts. I like to top it with a little bit of chili flakes. This is a really mild flavored thing. We have potatoes, we have white sauce, and we have white cheddar cheese. I like to put a little bit of chili flakes on top. That seems to give it a little bit of a kick. If it's not your thing, just eliminate that. But that will melt into that cheese and that will give it a really nice punch. And I'm going to finish that off with uh, some pepper because we love pepper. I'm not putting salt on it. There's probably enough salt in all those layers and in the cheese itself. When I bake it, I'm going to bake it on a sheet pan like this because it might spill over and I really don't want that to happen. I'm going to place this in the oven. Probably will take about maybe 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. It's not going to take long. It's pretty shallow. I'm going to clean this up and we are going to start our cake. As I was saying earlier, this cake uh, is from 1920, 1927, during the Great Depression. I don't know what was great about it. But it is when you couldn't get dairy and you couldn't get uh, eggs. And so they substituted it with, with mayonnaise. Now, uh, in the 40s, it, it wasn't so scarce. It was just rationed during the World War II. And so this mayonnaise cake became really popular because you don't use any fat and you don't use any eggs. But what is mayonnaise? It is oil and eggs whipped together. Now, um, Tom asked me earlier, could you use a Miracle Whip? I suppose you could. I really don't, I, I mean, I use mayonnaise anyway. I really don't know if, you, if Miracle Whip has the same, it probably would work. So we're going to start our cake. Uh, please take note of my new bowl. This was a Christmas present and I love it. So we are going to start that cake. Now uh, this cake also has a little bit of history because it was uh, then published. Hellman's, the, the person who owned Hellman's, the last name was Price and the wife decided that she was really going to make this cake and they published it on the side of Hellman's mayonnaise as something you could make with this product. It wasn't until Kraft got involved and Kraft then pushed it on their label and then that became a conflict because also they put it on their Miracle Whip label and it, it wasn't real mayonnaise. So this is one of those products that we've talked about before that like Libby's would do that and different companies do that where they publish a recipe on the side of their product and that's what Hellman's mayonnaise did. We're going to start off with one cup of water. Now if you're a bake right there you say that's weird. You know, how often do you put water and not milk in a cake? and then it is one cup of mayonnaise. This never appealed to me, never. And you know, just anytime, maybe you remember back to your grandmother or your, somebody in your family deciding that they were going to make a tomato soup cake. That was something Campbell's decided that was going to be an edible thing. And I remember my mom making this because my mom loved to make things that were uh, trendy and I could smell the tomato soup cake cooking and all I could smell was the tomato soup that's something like this I never it never appealed to me but it you know there's nothing like mayonnaise in a cake to keep it moist and it lasts long okay after that we are going to put in one teaspoon of vanilla extract remember I'm using my rum extract that I made over the Christmas holiday We'll put one teaspoon in there. That gives us a nice little bit of flavor. Hey, Dana's Kitchen's here. Shout out to Dana's Kitchen. Welcome. Um, 
it is still in Texas. Yeah, Dana is from Texas. We're just talking about how chilly it is here. Scallop potatoes. Okay, so that's what I just put in the oven. It's a scallop potato and ham, onions, and a white sauce with some cheddar cheese. That's been layered. If you want to go back later to the VOD and watch Dana, you'll see it there. Right now we're making an old, old classic. It is a mayonnaise cake. And, you know, this is, this is a depression dessert that you didn't have to use eggs or milk or fat in. After that, we're going to put in one cup of sugar. Okay, here we're finally in an ingredient that sounds like a cake. One cup of sugar, stir that in. Now, if you notice too, this is not a mixer. This is just a stir. And this is my Danish whisk. I'm always pushing these. Get yourself a Danish whisk if you don't have one. Darth, you would love it because I know you don't like to use a lot of food processors and things like that. You'd love this. Now, if you look at this in the overhead, if you look at this, you're going to see that the bubbles, everything is starting to look like an oil-based cake. So that mayonnaise has now gone into all of those ingredients and it's starting to look like there's real fat in this. Well, there is, I guess, with the mayonnaise. Three tablespoons of cocoa. My grandma would make the cake all the time, so good. See, that's just it. Sometimes we go back to what our grandmas made, and there was a reason why they, they made things. I heard about a rest, they made things like that because they knew through experience how to make something delicious, maybe on a budget, maybe fed a family, but I want to tell you about a recipe, or a, a restaurant I heard about in uh, someplace in the U.S., and I don't know which state it was, but it was called Grandma's Kitchen. And every week, a different grandma who would be hired for the week, they would have a different grandma, different, maybe ethnicity, come in and she would cook for the week. And the menu would change according to that person. So then they had a rotation of these grandmas and you started to know who was cooking at what time. So, you know, maybe you'd have an Italian Nona come in and you knew what that, that menu was going to be for the week. I like this idea. Okay, after the cocoa, we're going to put in two uh, teaspoons of baking soda. There's our leavening. I forgot the flour, of course, but I kind of think that's okay to put in at the last. What didn't I put into this cake that you would normally see in a cake? We talked a lot about it today. What didn't I put in? Producer's got it. it you know, I, I, I can't let the teacher out of the room because I'm still doing all of the bring you back in, make sure you're paying attention. I didn't add salt. And if that is because of the mayonnaise. There's mayonnaise in this. There's salt in the mayonnaise. All right, so I have to get this worked into a nice smooth cake batter. Okay, I was reading about that restaurant. It's in New York City. It is, that's right. It was, I just saw it. It was in New York City. Uh, the menu is half constant Italian and the other half visiting grandmas uh, if, uh, if live, I, if you're there to visit. Yes, and uh, I did read about a Polish grandma who goes there and so the menu just changes into uh, Polish ethnic food. Okay, you know, New York City knows how to do food. Let's just say that. Okay, I've got a really nice batter. It looks like there's oil. It looks like there's butter in here. So uh, yeah, this restaurant, I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Now, I don't know. There's some logistics there that you'd have to, you'd have to work out. I mean, they'd have to have, I'm always looking at the, the industry side of it. They'd have to have food safety handlers, they'd have to, I don't know, how do they get around all of that? I'm just going to um, grease this nine inch pan. It makes a small cake and then you can uh, frost this or not. I'm going to cook it today and I will frost it with uh, probably a chocolate brown sugar frosting, something like that. Now if you want to go into our menu or our recipes I believe I have this chocolate mayonnaise cake and the re there's a recipe for frosting there that if you'd like to try it <clears throat> so
So normally we do some farm tours and we have been doing quite a bit of farm tours. If you want to go on to our YouTube channel and check those out, we about every two weeks we do a farm tour and we then cook with the product we bring home from the farm. Uh, I know they have two separate kitchens. Oh, that's a possibility because, you know, there'd be certain uh, materials you'd need. There'd be certain things that I wonder if the grandma who comes to that kitchen would bring it, like, like my Dutch whisk. I wouldn't be able to go without it. Or, you know, or it's just some, some tools that would create, like if you're making spatzel and you need a spatzel maker. But that makes sense. Two kitchens. It sounds delightful, and we should do a little bit more, uh, maybe a little more research on that. Anyway, we do these farm tours, and we cook with the product that that farmer produces. And so we have cooked with uh, some beef, pork, uh, some Wagyu beef, which was delicious, uh, some sheep, some lamb. And uh, we do, and some maple syrup, honey from that farmer. So we do have uh, two farms booked right up until the spring. And there's a third one, but right now that farm is really busy with lambing. And uh, we've been invited to go there during the lambing. Uh, we've chosen to just take a little bit of break because the last thing we ever want to do is get in the middle of a busy farmer. And so we want to make sure that they're not overwhelmed, plus a camera and <clears throat> all of us there. We're just going to let them have a little bit of time to gather their busy schedule up, and then we're going to go there. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. There's our, our chocolate mayonnaise cake. It is uh, going to go into a 350 oven. You can see it it's, you know, fills this 9-inch square. You could even make it a little bit into an 8-inch. We are going to put this in the oven for about uh, 30 to 35 minutes. And, and Enoteca Maria, there's the name of the restaurant. You know, foodies will find other foodies. So would you go to this restaurant? Would you be, would you? I would. I would love to. You know what? You can't beat that experience that comes from that. And, you know, a real true grandma cook is always looking to gain more knowledge. They're not just like shutting down and that's it. I saw a 103-year-old woman who was cooking, and she was still cooking. And that's when you have to watch this person and take in that experience and that knowledge. She was just you know, over her cutting board, really working hard at it. Her hands had a lot of arthritis, but she didn't forget any of that. So I'm going to put this in the oven along with our gratin. Now, I do have two ovens. I just didn't want to preheat both of them, but I do have this thing, and I've got some cooks here. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. Uh, Texas, uh, I can't get the, the end of that. Cryptid. Okay, Texas Cryptid, thanks for coming on. I like to do the same thing. When I'm not streaming or I'm not cooking, that's what I'd like to do. And I haven't followed you, I don't think, and I'm going to because uh, I like to see as many cooks as I can. Like, I, I have two ovens. I like to cook in two separate ovens. I didn't heat it today. Do you have an issue with cooking and baking in the same oven? There are certain things I'll do it for. Uh, there's certain things I don't like the two smells together. But let's say I'm baking cookies. I would never then roast vegetables in that same oven because the steam would affect the rise of the cookies. And if you're a cook here, you probably agree with me. Wine repository is, we looked it up, that is Enoteca. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. But you know, that's a little, that's a curious restaurant. And I love it when I find out about one of these, you know, unique systems of sharing food and sharing different cultures like that. That is the end of our stream today. Uh, next week, we are going to be coming back with a little bit more about All Cloud. We're going to be doing some cleaning of it. I know this is not exciting, but you know, if you've invested in that cookware, you want to make sure that you take care of it. And we are going to be using uh, a new roasting pan, and we're going to be spatchcocking a chicken. So we're going to be breaking its spine, and we're going to be 
batch cocking it out flat. We're going to show you how to do a one sheet pan and that's yummy and that's easy. So uh, we're also going to be doing another tour and we're going to be bringing you that. So uh, keep cooking, keep nourishing yourself and those you love. Until then, this kitchen is closed.